Welcome. So much to think about, so little time. First, the conservative majority on the Supreme Court comes down on the side of federal power over states' rights in campaign spending, jailing kids for life, and if you look closely, on some aspects of who makes immigration policy. How'd that happen? About immigration, we'll hear how the new work permit rules fulfill a dream for one young activist. Tomorrow, the Supreme Court is expected to decide the fate of Obamacare, but we'll put some power in your hands, showing you the equivalent of Priceline for healthcare services. We'll also hear about new competition for the iPad, and later on, our resident curmudgeon, Greg David, will be here to try and turn all those city hall smiles about the balanced budget upside down. First, the High Court. Joining us via Skype from Charlottesville, Virginia, Dahlia Lithwick, Supreme Court watcher, senior editor at Slate. Hi, Dahlia. Hello from New York. Hi, Brian. Hi from Charlottesville. So people here in New York and 20 states all together were hoping that Montana would prevail at the Supreme Court this week and the states would be able to get around the Citizens United campaign finance ruling at least for state and local elections. Seemed like a compelling argument. Why didn't the Supreme Court buy it? Well, they didn't buy it for one thing because the way this Montana case came up to the court was a real slap at the court. In other words, you have a, a state Supreme Court saying, yeah, we just don't like Citizens United. It doesn't apply to us. So it's not really a surprise that coming to the court in that posture, the por court would see the need to smack them down. Uh, but in a deeper way, I mean, I think underlying your question, I think this is the way that the court makes perfectly clear in a very brief summary reversal that Citizens United applies to the states as well. The court went against the states in saying they could not give a sentence of life in prison without parole as a mandatory sentence law to minors. So, Dahlia, why is the federal Supreme Court mucking around in states' criminal justice sentencing laws? Well, because there's a federal constitutional question that says, what is cruel and unusual punishment under the Eighth Amendment? What are the evolving standards of decency is the test? And the court says the evolving standards of decency around the entire country require that we do away with life without parole, mandatory life without parole. Judges still can still give those sentences, but we're going to do away with them in the 29 states where they're mandatory. So the, the, the federal constitutional protection uh, under the Eighth Amendment overrides the state's uh, sentencing deals. And on the Arizona immigration law, Arizona wanted to say, look, we're on the front lines of all this illegal immigration to the United States across the border from Mexico. We want to make it a state crime as well as a federal crime to be here illegally and be able to do something about it at the state level if the federal government is not uh, successfully enforcing immigration laws. And again, the court said no. That's right. Now, this is a, a slightly easier one, Brian, simply because it's long been the case, and the court determined again that it is the case now, that immigration is the province of the federal government, that the federal government has occupied this area, and that states don't go, get to go around and set their own immigration laws. And so, yes, the state's desire to set its own immigration regime up, if it's in conflict with the federal one, then the federal one trumps, and that's what the court agreed with. Does this all surprise you? I mean, the conservative Tea Party uh, makes the Tenth Amendment, states' rights, they even call it state sovereignty, uh, a core principle. Um, and I thought so-called conservatives on the court would be much more inclined to allow states to do things than to want to express federal power. Well, I think that there are lots of different uh, strands of, of conservative legal thought. And one of them, you've just articulated a strong states' rights, federalist tradition, the, the Tenth Amendment, the idea that states do have sovereignty. And we certainly heard a lot of that in Justice Scalia's dissent in the Arizona case. 
But I don't think this is the state's rights court that the Rehnquist court was. When we had William H. Rehnquist, Sandra Day O'Connor on the court, uh, that was a real high water mark for states' rights jurisprudence. Since they've left the court and been replaced by Roberts and Alito, much more faint-hearted defense of states' rights, other conservative issues certainly being pushed, but the idea that states have dignity, uh, in the words of the Rehnquist court, has fallen a little bit uh, by the wayside. And so you do see, uh, remember, both Roberts and Alito worked for the federal government. They worked uh, uh, in the Justice Department, they don't have that strong, I would say, almost Western view of the world that Rehnquist and O'Connor had. It's just a different view of federal power. And I was struck by one line in the Scalia dissent where he said, if the colonies had known that the federal government would take immigration law unto itself, they never would have joined the Union. Ha! Huh. And I thought, well, that's a pretty hypothetical argument on which to base the Supreme Court interpretation of the Constitution. Uh, one of the things that's really astounding about the Scalia dissent uh, in the Arizona case, which should be read in its entirety, uh, because there are so many whopping great lines, but he toggles back and forth between uh, originalist reading of uh, the framers and their view of the world and President Obama's press conference uh, about the DREAM Act only last week. So there's a lot of history in between uh, that he's not really interested in, but he's incredibly interested in this mental image of, of, of the delegates fleeing from the Grand Convention, as he says, running for the exits, uh, and also really, really interested in President Obama's uh, decisions on how to conduct immigration policy neither of which really are that much at issue in this case. So if this is the federal power court, I wonder how that sets up the ruling we expect tomorrow morning on the Obama health reform law, because one of the two big complaints about the law in that, uh, uh, in that case, of course, one is the individual mandate. The other one is 26 states arguing that the federal government can't enact a law forcing them to expand their Medicaid roles so much. But the Obama position is, look, Medicaid is a federal program. Uh, so does what we saw yesterday or Monday indicate to you that the Supreme Court is likely to come down on the side of upholding Obamacare, at least with respect to the expanded Medicaid, to get more people covered that way? You know, I don't think so, having more less to do with the Arizona case and more to do with just sitting in the chamber when the Medicaid expansion was argued. That was a real reach. Uh, no lower court had taken that seriously, the complaint that the states were making that they were being commandeered uh, into expanding Medicaid. And in fact, Medicaid has been expanded before without incident. So this was a real reach, and nobody quite knew at the time why the court took it. Uh, and I think after argument, it certainly looked as though some of that states' rights discourse and some of that real strong uh, state sovereignty language you were just citing did come out at argument. But I don't see five votes uh, for doing away with the Medicaid expansion. And if there were, then really every federal state partnership is in trouble and, and there are bigger issues to worry about. But I think in terms of tea leaves and looking at what's going to happen tomorrow, I don't think I have any sense, based on anything that's happened in the last few weeks, other than hearing the arguments in March, of what's going to happen. In other words, I don't think that much has changed, even though the zeitgeist sort of zipped or, zips around from week to week and the predictions change. I don't have a sense that that much has changed since March that would really cause me to rethink uh, what's going to happen tomorrow. Dahlia Lithwick from Slate, thank you very, very much. Thank you for having me. And viewers, I invite you to tune into my radio show on WNYC tomorrow morning at 10. That's exactly when the health reform Supreme Court decision is expected to be announced, and we will have live coverage. Coming up next right here, advice for the young and undocumented. skating with my friend 
He had an extra board, and then he just gave it to me, and I've been skating ever since. Well, when I don't learn a trick and I have my mind set on something and I'm not getting what I want, I just keep going for it until I get it right. Um, my mom, she didn't go to college, so she wants me to experience that whole thing. And so I could end up getting like a good job. To get into college, I'll have to be determined. Just like when I want to get a new trick, and skating's helped me realize I've got what it takes. On June 15th, as you probably know, President Barack Obama announced to the over 800,000 undocumented immigrants under 30 years old living in this country for at least the last five years that they would no longer be subject to deportation depending on their history and circumstances. For some young people, are the devils in the details. Alan Wernick is an immigration lawyer who specializes in the legal wrangling it takes to become a citizen and will help us unpack the policy. And joining us via Skype from Washington, D.C. is Evelyn Rivera, a National Coordinating Committee member for United We Dream. Evelyn, now 23, was brought to the United States from Colombia when she was just three years old and is what they call a dreamer. Welcome, both of you, to the show. Thank you for doing this. Thank you. Thank you. Alan Warwick, and you, of course, work for CUNY Citizenship Now. Yes. Helping immigrants who are not yet citizens attain citizenship That's correct. all day, all year, all That's week. That's right. Um, now, with this new policy, we should clarify, first of all, that it is not a path to citizenship, per se, is it? That's correct. It just it provides two years legal status and employment authorization, protection from being re forcibly removed from the United States. And for some people, I think it will make it easier to become a permanent resident, but it, in and of itself, does not create a path to permanent residence or U.S. citizenship. A two-year work permit might scare some people, when you put it that way. Yeah. The president did make a point of setting this up so that they are indefinitely renewable two-year permits, two plus two plus two, theoretically for the rest of people's lives. How do you understand it? Well, that's right, theoretically for the rest of people's lives. I know some people are concerned that if there was a Romney administration, it could be reversed, and there's nothing in the law that, uh, our laws that prevent a, a new president from reversing the policy, but I doubt that that would happen. I think that uh, once the history of these kinds of programs is that once the people get their legal status, they become integrated in society, they start working, they have a whole group of employers who care about them. I think we're going to find out a lot of these dreamers are among the best and the brightest of our students. I think it's that the chances are very, very uh, slim uh, uh, to, uh, that anyone is going to reverse this policy. And as I've, as I've written and said, you know, if it was my uh, sister or daughter or, or, or spouse, I certainly would want uh, her to apply for this process. Evelyn, I think you're in both the age group and the other criteria status uh, that would make you uh, eligible for this, from what I understand. Will you go for it? Uh, most definitely. It's, uh, it's something we've been working um, very hard for and something that's going to help me in, in my future and help me reach my goals. So I'm very thankful for this announcement that we have the chance of applying for. Do you feel secure or when you hear Romney say that he will supersede this, his word, if he becomes president. Do you worry that you're going to put your name in the system, you're going to register with the government, they're going to know who you are, they're going to know where you are, and all of a sudden this protection might go away? I don't. Well, for my case in particular, my name's already in the system. I've had two petitions filed for me, um, but because I'm 23, it's, it's a longer process. I'm not really considered a, a child anymore in the eyes of immigration here in the United States. Um, but even if I didn't have those petitions, um, I think it's a great opportunity. And I think this is actually just going to give us more power to keep fighting and making sure that we get comprehensive immigration reform as a whole for the rest of our community. So, Alan, what does somebody like Evelyn do 
today, tomorrow, next week to actually apply for this? Well, uh, today or this week, they don't do anything uh, except for perhaps gather documents to prove that they qualify, which is uh, proof that they entered the United States before the age of 16, they were physically present here, that they've been in the United States at least five years, that they're not yet 31, that would be a birth certificate, um, and that they were physically present on June 15th. Other than that, there is no uh, procedure that's been announced, and the, the uh, the Department of Homeland Security has said that in, they would have 60 days uh, to to come up with the procedure. That would end. Up, that would take us to about August 15th. So what I'm anticipating is around that time, the 14th or 15th, we're going to get some kind of final statement about how the procedure is going to work. Then there'll be uh, then people will file their applications, and it's going to be a little bit of a drawn out process. But for right now, it's very important that people not be taken advantage of because there are people who are already offering. To, for a fee to help people prepare their application. And except for gathering those documents, like your school records and employment records, there's really nothing to be done right now. Before I go back to Evelyn, you said yes. prove that they're not yet 31. Yes, that's now, correct. Now, I've heard two different versions of this. That's I've right. heard that on June 15th, the day that's the president right. announced this, you had to be not yet 30. Is yes. it 30 or 31? Well, it's 31. I, I think that it was a drafting error in the press release. I think that the president wanted to have a cutoff of 30. But the way it was worded, it seemed to imply that it could be 31. And since, since the press release, there's been a, a clarification from the Department of Homeland Security that if you're under th not yet 31 on June 15th, you'll qualify. But I think it was a mistake, but a good mistake. All right, so that includes uh, at least one more year's worth of people in this category. Evelyn, tell us about your group, United We Dream. Who are you, what do you do? So United We Dream is actually the largest um, immigrant youth-led network um, here in the United States. Um, we have about 30 affiliate, or in 30 states, we have about 40 affiliate groups um, all over. And um, and so what we've we've been doing with our organization is um, because of this new announcement, we've realized that we really need to educate our community. And so we've been setting up webinars and educational toolkits. Um, so that they know, you know, not they don't need to get a lawyer yet, and they have a lot of questions about the age requirements. And so, you know, we've just been letting them know just to hold up, to wait. And so, that's been our main focus right now. But we do a lot of organizing um, within our regions and try to get more membership and really help students enter college and know that they have a chance to be part of the United States and that they don't need to feel ashamed at all um, because of their immigration status. Is there a most common question that your group is getting since the president's? announcement or a most common misconception that you think is out there based on your experience? Um, one that we've gotten a lot, mostly from the Hispanic community actually, has been will we be able to join the military? Um, a lot of people were hoping that they could. Um, and then we've had some questions about um, the age limit. Um, they're very close to it, just a few months short. Um, so could they qualify um, if they try to battle it? Um, and then, of course, a lot of questions concerning the misdemeanors and driving without a license. But we have been told that that will not um, go against us um, since we were driving without licenses because we were undocumented. And so that shouldn't be our fault. How about this military thing, Alan Wernick? Um, if you served in the military and were honorably discharged, that's one of the allowable criteria, along with having gone yes. to high school and finished high school. And a, a, an immigrant who's here illegally can join the military? They no. don't check for that? No, they, they do check for that. It's sort of si silly. I think, that, I think the president wanted his proposal to track the Legislative Dream Act, which does refer to being in the military as a condition of getting status. But it's, it has happened that by mistake, a person who is undocumented has entered the military. And if that happens, and there, there's a re, there was a recent case over the last few years, the person immediately qualifies for U.S. citizenship. So the notion that somebody would have served in the military and not without and then need this DREAM Act, it's sort of silly. I don't think we're going to find many people that qualify uh, under that uh, criteria. The question is, will somebody who has deferred action qualify to enter the military? And so far, no. But there's no reason why the, the, the executive branch of the government couldn't decide that that was okay. If that happened under our current laws during a time of active hostilities, which we're in uh, since September 11th, according to Presidents Bush and Obama, you would automatically qualify for naturalization. What's this going to cost people? And will they need lawyers? 
Uh, it's not going to cost. We don't know what it's going to cost. Uh, as most people are predicting there will be a filing fee. I don't know. You know, we th this is a new thing. Um, the 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 fee for the biometrics, which is the fingerprinting, is eighty five dollars. We don't know whether they'll be allowed to file for a fee waiver. Um, so there's a lot of questions that are, are yet to be answered. Um, do they need a lawyer? I would say in most cases, no. There may be some cases where uh, there'll be an especially a difficult amount of advocacy required. Like for instance, let's say a person never was in high school uh, until, or, and then they uh, here in the United States, and then they went to college at age 20. They may have difficulty proving that they were physically present in the United States before the age of 16. Uh, that might require a little bit more advanced advocacy. But there's going to be a lot of uh, resources out there, we're hoping. And we're looking to the foundations, if any of them are listening, uh, to come in and, and provide some, uh, some, some monies for groups like uh, the United We Dream, because they're, they're closest to the students. And groups like that, I think, can do a great job with some help from some lawyers um, in, in putting together packages and assisting people in applying. Evelyn, uh, my, my understanding is you are out as a person who's here uh, undocumented or illegally before June 15th, not only after the president came out with this announcement. What inspired you to come out publicly with your status? Um, so for me, it was actually back in 2010. I had the chance of coming to Washington, D.C. for the Trail of Dreams um, when the four walkers from Miami walked all the way to Washington, D.C., asking to stop the separation of families um, and to protect us from deportations and to pass the DREAM Act. And so that was my first real experience with the undocumented community because before that, I didn't talk about it. My family was like, no, you know, we can't. It has to be like a family secret. Um, but after that experience, I saw thousands of other students that were in my same situation, and that really inspired me and made me realize that I needed to start fighting for my future and for the future of those um, that aren't ready to come out yet. Are you optimistic, Evelyn, no matter who's elected president? It seems like Romney is trying very hard to not say no to this and to kind of give a nod and a wink to the idea that he might be for comprehensive immigration reform, even though he took pretty much the opposite position during the heat of the primary campaign. I am. I'm, I'm very excited for this news. And um, as I've talked to others um, that I organize with, and we feel like this is a really good opportunity right now that we have this clean slate that we can start fresh and really start pushing so that real changes are made in the immigration, um, in, in immigration law. So we're excited to keep pushing and make sure that we're all protected and that our community and our families are safe. Evelyn Rivera, Alan Wernick, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Up next. Microsoft takes on the mighty iPad. When you throw away money on wasted electricity, you're throwing away everything you could have bought with it. Saving energy saves you money. Learn more at energysavers.gov. Remember the Zune? It was Microsoft's failed attempt to take on the iPod. Now Microsoft is going head to head with Apple again, this time with a tablet called Surface that aims to bring down the iPad. How viable a competitor will it be? 
Here with me to take a look is Gadget expert Peter Rojas, co-founder of The Social Network. Gadget. Hey, Peter, welcome back. Uh, thanks for having me back. And normally when you come to the show, you bring actual gadgets to yes. display and describe and review. There, there is no Surface yet. Uh, so no one has had a chance to review it yet. They had a very big launch event in Los Angeles, of all places, which is unusual for a big tech launch. Uh, and they were very careful not to let any journalists uh, really spend any real time with it. Uh, they... Uh, had units that were on, but they wouldn't let you take it and play with it and yeah. test it out on your own. And it's not even clear when uh, journalists will have a chance to, to get some real time with it. Yeah, so it exists, but it really only exists in their office. Yes. And you were able to, to look at it for a a small period. That's of about time. it. Yeah. So, uh, so anyone uh, who said that they've reviewed it, or they, they, no one has reviewed it yet. But whatever little informal reviews have been coming out have struck me as being very positive. People think Microsoft might have something here. Well, uh, so um, you know, Microsoft is uh, has actually changed a little bit in the past few years. I mean, they've really um, uh, started to understand that to compete with Apple, they have to start making better design products and that they have to start thinking about those little details that Apple thinks about. And so if you uh, go and actually watch the video of the presentation, they spent a lot of time in their uh, in the the, uh, the launch event for the Surface talking about how the device was made and all the you know the, the laser etching of the of the keyboard and the metal that they use and the special glass and you know all those sort of things that were very Apple esque actually in their their attention to detail and in their presentation and even in the fact that this is about hardware because that's not what Microsoft is known for we mentioned the Zune which you know didn't really take off and except for maybe the Xbox. Yeah, the Xbox has actually been remarkably successful for them and is the number one connected video device uh, you know, in the United States. So more people are using their Xbox for watching video than actually for playing video games huh. uh, these days, or online video games, I should say. And uh, uh, the Zune was something that uh, came to market really late. It was a few years behind the, the, uh, the iPod, and, and Microsoft you know, really never uh, marketed it successfully. They realize now that there isn't really a tablet market, there is an iPad market. And if they're going to be relevant in the future of computing, which is touch-based devices like the tablet, they have to have a successful competitor. And they are uh, not ready to let their partners like Dell and Asus and other companies like you know, HP that have uh, you know, been in this market before and which have made tablets and not been very successful, they're not willing to risk those guys uh, screwing it up. Now, from what I could tell, Microsoft continues its pattern of having things that are more heavily loaded compared to Apple, which is simpler and sleeker, but not maybe with as many features. So this iPad, this uh, tablet from Microsoft, non-iPad tablet, um, is going to have a keyboard, external keyboard, but it's attached, and it's going to have some, some ports for, uh, uh, for plugins. So the complication is that the Surface is going to come in two versions. There's going to be the Surface RT. It's actually the Microsoft Surface with Windows RT and the Microsoft Surface with uh, Windows Pro or something like that. I'm trying to remember exactly which version. Uh, it's needlessly complicated, but there's basically a, a simpler version and a more complicated version. The Pro version runs the full version of Windows 8, which is the new version of Windows, which is coming out later this year. And it has both a touch-centric tablet interface, which they call Metro, and then it has the more traditional Windows desktop interface. And uh, it will run regular Windows applications just like Windows 7 does today. So if you want to run Office, you want, want to run games and things like that, you can do that. Windows RT is a more stripped down version of Windows, which only has that touch-based Metro interface. And it will not run traditional Windows applications. It will really only run applications designed specifically for Windows RT. Uh, sort of like the difference between the iPad now, which runs applications just for iOS, and uh, Mac OS, which runs the full-blown thing. With what Microsoft has done, which is a little confusing, is you can get the version that's basically just like the iPad, and then you can get the version that's sort of the iPad interface and then the regular Windows interface on top of it. And the Pro version costs more. It's going to come out three months after the, the RT version, uh, but it is more fully featured. So if you do want something that maybe can replace both your laptop and your tablet, you have that option. I think that the RT version will be something that is really just an iPad competitor. And you will, each will be able to, be, to work with a uh, magnetic keyboard case, which is extremely thin, which will attach onto it and let you use it, either, either version, somewhat like uh, a laptop with the, in, you know, the keyboard input. What don't we know about it? I've heard that we don't know some pretty basic things about it, like maybe speed and memory. 
So uh, yeah, we don't know, for instance, the uh, screen resolution of the RT version of the tablet, which is pretty important. Um, you know, the new iPad has an extremely high resolution retina display, which great makes screen. Yeah, the text looks phenomenal, video looks great on it. Uh, we don't know what the RT version is going to look like um, by comparison. We don't know the pricing. We don't know exactly when it's going to come out. We know it'll be sometime between now and the end of the year, but uh, we don't know whether it's going to be September, October. Uh, we don't know uh, whether there will be versions that work with the 4G wireless networks like the iPad uh, has that option. And if so, will those be at the same time or will those be later? Uh, and, and I think that uh, if it is not priced competitively with the iPad, that people will feel like, well, I, I, I know this, I trust this, and uh, I'm not necessarily going to take a risk on, on this new platform. Right. Well, Apple usually prices things higher than the competition because their reputation is so good, right? The funny thing is that that is uh, actually uh, something that is becoming a thing of the past. Mm. If you look at the iPad, it is actually uh, priced as aggressively or, or better than uh, many of its competitors, and it's actually made it very difficult. In the past 10 years or so, Apple's invested a lot in its supply chain and being able to, they'll go out and buy $3 billion worth of memory uh, to corner the market and to, to buy up the supply and to get it at a, a deep discount. So they actually have been able to uh, bring the prices of their computers and their tablets down, uh, making it very difficult for their competitors who you know, used to compete on price to be able to match them or even exceed them in terms of pricing. Now I also hear that Google is going to come out with its own tablet. Mm -hmm. Do you so, know what that's going to be? Yes, yeah, so they are going to be coming out with a 7-inch tablet that will be similar to the Kindle Fire, which we saw uh, late last year from Amazon. Small. It will be small, uh, and it will be uh, similar to the Nexus program that Google has for phones. So Google has every year will pick a hardware partner. Uh, it, they've worked with HTC. They've worked with Samsung a couple of times now. And that company will actually will build the device. And uh, so what we expect is that there will be a partner that they will announce who will actually build this tablet for them and that it will run the latest version of Android, which will be uh, Android 4.1, and that it will probably have some uh, features uh, to take advantage of, of uh, you know, the form factor that we haven't seen before. Why do you think some of the tablets that do exist that do run Google's Android operating system have not competed well against the iPad so far? I think, uh, in my experience, that... Uh, Google has not done enough work on the user interface to make it uh, friendly enough for the tablet. I think it, uh, Android works actually pretty well as a phone. It hasn't worked quite as well uh, as, as a tablet. I think one of the other issues is that um, you know, if you use an iPad, it's extremely responsive when you touch it. it it's, uh, uh, there's not any sort of lag in your motions and, and gestures and things like that. And uh, most of the Android tablets do tend to have some issues with that, and I think that it frustrates people to, especially if you're going to spend five or six hundred dollars on a device like that, and that's so uh, uh, gesture driven that if it isn't immediately responsive, if it doesn't feel like um, you're touching something and something happens right away, uh, that it does frustrate people. And Android is improving in that area, but it has, no pun intended, it has actually lagged behind iOS mm. uh, in terms of its responsiveness. Um, for Google and for Microsoft, do they think they're going to make a lot of money on the tablets themselves, or is it the things they can sell? for the tablets being a conduit for books and selling apps and stuff like that. And is that different from Apple? Well, uh, so Google doesn't charge a licensing fee for Android. Um, their model to date has been, let's try to get Android on as many different devices as possible, and then that'll create a larger market for our search product and our advertising product. And they do make some money there, but they haven't made as much money as, say, Apple does. Uh, Apple walks away with actually the bulk of the profits from the mobile industry, I think something like 70 to 80% of the profit in the mobile industry uh, is it goes to Apple, and most of the rest goes to Samsung. And uh, for Google, they're not necessarily making that much money from doing these. Um, I think Microsoft is looking at how they transition to maybe a different kind of company going forward. Uh, if they can't charge the manufacturer, PC manufacturer, seventy-five dollars or eighty-five dollars to put Windows on a tablet that they then sell for three hundred or four hundred dollars, it just doesn't make any sense. So it may be that Apple has to do something that, I mean, that Microsoft has to do something that they've been very reluctant to do, which is to say, we're going to get very directly into this business and we're going to uh, make money from selling hardware, making and selling hardware and not be so reliant on those licensing fees. Well, we will see what the uh, Microsoft Surface actually turns out to be once it comes out.
competition is good. You know, I think Apple is sort of crossing that line, that threshold from being always super cool to being super cool, but also maybe a little too big for its britches. Well, I think uh, uh, one of the things that um, I always think is funny is that people still perceive Apple as an underdog, um, but they're actually the largest <laughs> business in the world at this point. I mean, they're up there with Exxon, and, and certainly no one uh, thinks of, of big oil companies as underdogs at this point. And so um, I, I think it's very healthy. I think Microsoft uh, certainly um, is not a company that people are scared of. No one calls it the evil empire, empire anymore, and, and no one is worried about them monopolizing things. And so it's very healthy to have the competition. And no one, uh, least of all consumers, should want the tablet market to end up like the MP3 player market, where you had one company that dominated and there wasn't that much innovation until a new category like phones came along. No date? Any guess for a date? Uh, I'm hearing that uh, September, October. Mm, so, Peter Ross, thanks a lot. Thank you. When you're buying an airline ticket, Chances are you turn to a website like Kayak, Hitmonk, or Travelocity to help you find the lowest fares. And there are sites out there that let you comparison shop for the best deal on cars, electronics, used books, pretty much anything. But there's one monumental exception, healthcare. There's no easy way to tell where to get, where to get the best price on an MRI or a prescription drug or a mammogram. And those prices are all over the map. My next guest has created a website designed to fill that gap. It's called clearhealthcosts.com. Before we meet her, here's a preview from their own explanatory video. What we did, among other things, was to call up providers and ask them what they charge for various things in healthcare. For example, you might be surprised to know that an MRI here in New York could cost you $350 or it could cost you as much as $2,300. That's not the only list of prices we've done. Here's our first crowdsourcing exercise. We chose the price of birth control pills. We asked women to tell us how much they were paying for a common birth control pill. You might be surprised to know that here in the New York City area, a common brand could cost you $17, or it could cost you $50. But our lists aren't big enough. Our goal is to make the true prices of every health procedure in the country available to anyone with an internet connection. To do that, we need your help. We want people to tell us anonymously what things cost them in the healthcare marketplace. Jeannie Pinder, whose voice we just heard, is the founder of clearhealthcosts.com, and she's here with me now. Thanks for coming in. Thanks for having me. So did the inspiration for this come from your own experience with health care bills? Yes, sadly enough it did. I got a bill once from a hospital for a drug that cost $1,419, but I actually found that I could buy it online for $2.49. Wow. Yes. Markup, special price for me today only. And that was where the inspiration was born. I figured if it was that one bill, then what about all the rest of them? And increasingly, even people who have insurance are paying ever larger chunks out of pocket for premiums, deductibles, co-pays, all of that stuff. Absolutely. It's a growing problem. Everybody's got a story. I bet you have a story. I, I have a story, and I have, you know, many stories. But we're going to stick to your story today. I, I'm curious, too. The Supreme Court, as everybody knows, is expected to rule tomorrow uh -huh. on the Obamacare law. Right. Um, do you think whether that goes one way or another is relevant to the service that you're trying to provide and the kinds of information that people are having trouble getting? Do you know, we think that in any case, whether the individual mandate or the entire law stands or falls, we'll still find people wanting to shop, wanting to know what stuff costs. As you pointed out, you can shop for airline tickets, real estate, cars, Everything that used to be a big, opaque marketplace has given way towards transparency and technology. We also think that um, because people are paying so much money, it's such a big problem that people are increasingly going to want to know what they're, what they're paying. And regardless of what happens with the law, we will increasingly be heading in the direction of more money out of your pocket. So how does your website work? And we're going to put up another example in a minute. Okay. We saw that video, but, uh -huh. but start to tell us, how does this work? Well, we uh, collect information from four separate sites. I come from journalism. I was at the New York Times for almost 25 years as a reporter, editor, and HR exec. 
So when people started telling me that we could not bring transparency to the healthcare marketplace, I said, well, why don't we just call people and ask them what they charge? So that's what we did. We sat down and called providers and said, what do you, we're calling from a new independent consumer healthcare research organization. We'd like to know your cash or self-pay price for certain procedures. Uh, so journalism is one way co we collect information. We're digging deep into government databases, piles of figures, what the government pays for things. We're doing crowdsourcing. And then we're also partnering with various other providers of services and people who are interested in these costs to find stuff out and tell people about it. Let's see, I think we have a view to show of your map or your website. Tell us what we're looking at here. Uh -huh. Well, let's see, up at the top of the page, we have what we call a price map, which is built on a big government database uh, reflecting what the government paid last year in Medicare for various procedures across this great wide land of ours. And if you use the search engine to visualize and personalize, you can search for, let's say, cervical spinal fusion in New York City. And you'll find this list of what the government paid last year at these various hospitals. You can sort the list from top to bottom. Uh, the prices range from 4100 at Bellevue to 31000 on Long Island. Wow. Um, so this is a way of allowing you to see how those disparities really look in the marketplace. And you'll probably never look at a hospital bill the same way again. Doesn't the government have enough clout to say to that hospital on Long Island, look, we get this for a tenth of the cost or whatever it is at some places, we're just not paying that. You know, that's a really good question. When you look at those numbers, you can have a whole range of questions like that. Were they over-treating somebody in Long Island? Were there more procedures attached to that? Bellevue typically has a lower income population. Are they charging less? What's behind those numbers? We didn't get that deep underneath it. We just took the database and allowed you to look at it so that you can ask those questions. And this is a crowdsourcing project, right? So when you get that map put together, when you have those pins on the map, right. um, individuals out there are providing the numbers? So that database that underlies that map was just based on a government database. We've also done crowdsourcing that was on a separate map with a very similar interface. We asked women to tell us what they were paying for their birth control pills, and it really was quite interesting, actually. People wanted to share, they wanted to tell us, People are incensed at the price variations in this marketplace and what they're paying out of pocket, what their employers are paying. People really want to talk about this. Who benefits from this lack of transparency? Well, as you know, there are multiple players in the marketplace, uh, payers, also known as insurance companies, providers, also known as doctors, hospitals. Um, they have intermediaries so a payer might, for example, have somebody challenging a hospital bill while a hospital has an intermediary that's paid to help maximize revenue, they call it. So you have a lot of players in the marketplace and everybody benefits from that opacity except for you. Now, an individual can sometimes, until your website is so successful that it standardizes the prices and uh -huh. makes it a real transparent market like markets are supposed to be. Right. Um, until that time, I think an individual can sometimes, if they're uninsured, say to their doctors, look, I'm going to pay you, obviously, but can I pay you the same price that an insurance company would pay you? Because if I was insured, you would still do this procedure for me or this test for me, and you would be happy to get that much money. Right. Sometimes that works. Quite often that does work, but quite often the consumer doesn't really know that prices vary that much. You might not feel comfortable with negotiating. You might not realize that prices vary by a factor of 10. And mo because most people believe that the marketplace isn't quite that elastic. So what we're about is giving you that information so that you can have that conversation and so that um, everybody has a little bit more information in the marketplace. Is there political pressure that's going to come to bear from this? 
if your website is successful? I, I think everybody in the system and outside of the system really dislikes it at this point. I think pretty much everybody knows that it's broken, uh, but nobody knows how to fix it. I do think that the health care uh, reform law made some really important steps towards changing it, but we feel that the best way to change it is to put power in the hands of the consumers. We call it disintermediation, which is one of the things that the internet is really good at. Who's paying for this uh, act of journalism and crowdsourcing <laughs> that you're trying to commit? Thanks for asking. Uh, so far, we're funded by three separate grants from really fabulous organizations, the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism uh, and the Tao Knight Foundation, the International Women's Media Foundation, and the JLab McCormick Foundation. A total of $54,000 in grant money because people want transparency. I also have two great business partners with parallel business interests who've really helped us so far. And we're about ready to roll out our revenue strategy with the relaunch of the website coming soon. Good. Uh, can people see anything right now? Yeah, what we have up right now is the beta website that's been up for a number of months. And in uh, exactly four weeks, if not less, we'll roll out the brand new improved clearhealthcost.com with much more information and an easier user interface. Great. Have you seen any patterns yet? Like things are cheaper in the city than they are in the suburbs. You mentioned that Long Island example or anything. Uh, well, we've seen that here in New York, the prices vary by a factor of 10, which is quite interesting. The MRI could be 350 or we actually found 3,300. Uh, yes. The government pays $497 for that same MRI. Mammogram, $75 to 869 But no geographical pattern, uh, type of institution pattern. Uh, more expensive typically in hospitals. Um, less expensive in self-standing radiology centers. New York seems to have wider variations so far from what we know. Mm. Um, but uh, there are also wide disparities in other places. And it's only the beginning. I have a feeling yes. we'll talk more about this. Thank you. Thank you. Up next, the new New York City budget. Sensible economics or smoke and mirrors? When you smoke around kids, you expose them to thousands of chemicals that are eating them alive. Cigarette smoke contains poisons like cyanide and carbon monoxide that trigger severe health problems, like painful ear infections crippling asthma, and deadly pneumonia. Cigarette smoke is linked to low birth weight and doubles the risk of sudden infant death syndrome. Cigarettes are eating you and your kids alive. Quit smoking today. For help, call 311. I look up to a lot of the older heads, you know, the, the innovators, the heads of the art movements of the past. They kept it really edgy and like a lot of the Latin American muralists and Latin American artists and um, their styles are very unique and new to their time. You know, somewhat controversial, but that's who I look up to mainly. Personally, I'm very excited about going to college. It's something new and it's something different than what I'm used to. I'm definitely gonna be a little out of my element, but um, that's what makes it so exciting is that, you know, it's something fresh. Well, there's so many opportunities that I think I could miss out on if I didn't go, you know? Getting into college takes planning and vision. You know, it's just like when I take a brick wall and turn it into a canvas for my art. Paintings help me realize that I've got what it takes. Celebration at City Hall this week about the budget agreement. The new fiscal year begins July 1st. Child care and after school programs will not be slashed after all. No big layoffs. In fact, a few more teachers. No new taxes. How is this possible? Greg David isn't sure it is. He teaches business reporting here at CUNY's Graduate School of Journalism and is author of Modern New York The Life and Economics of a City. Hi, Greg. Hi, Brian. So there is obviously a disconnect here between all the politicians involved who are saying, this is great, we save things, it's a balanced budget, and it seems like the various budget watchdogs, including you in your way, who are saying, I don't know, gimmicks, one-shots, uncertainties, what's your take? It's the worst budget Mayor Bloomberg has done in all his years. Seriously? Seriously. Look, this is Mr. Fiscal Rectitude. This is the person who 
broke his campaign pledge to raise property taxes at the end of his first year in office because he was going to have a solid budget. This is the person who accumulated surpluses year after year because he was going to be ready when things got bad. There are more than three billion dollars of one-shots in this budget and no fundamental restructurings of city government. Um, you know, I think he decided early this year that with two years to go and his clout waning, that he just wasn't going to have a budget fight, and he stuck to it. Let's take the taxi cab, you know. A billion dollars in revenue this year and next year and a little bit the year after from that. The sale from the sale of more medallions, which of is hung outer, up in court. Outer borough taxi plan, hung up in court. So this is a billion dollars in revenue for the city if... The courts say it's okay. Absolutely. And when will they know? Will they? I mean, court cases drag on sometimes. Will we even know in this fiscal year? No, we don't know in this year. And the bigger number is actually this. He put all this money into this retiree health care fund because we don't fund our retiree health care costs. Well, he took the last $1.6 billion out this year. So where's that $1.6 billion going to come from next year? You know, there's the great disconnect that people in finance understand, but not other people. City finance understand. You know, the city's economy does not equate to the city budget. The city budget equates to Wall Street, and Wall Street's future is so uncertain. So this is a gamble. The one thing I don't understand is he's got another budget to do. Next year. What's he going to do next year? I don't have a clue. But let me, let me push back a little bit. I, I could see an argument that would say, well, this year we do have these one-shots available, the uncertainty about the medallions notwithstanding. So if we can do this this year, let's do it this year. And then if we have to make more cuts next year because there's nothing else that comes down the pike, then we'll do it next year. That's terrible, Brian. That's what got us into the fiscal crisis. No. You, that's what he hasn't done all along. He's never done that. He's never postponed the tough decisions until now. And I disagree on one point. I think the budget hawks have been so strangely silent mm. this year. They have not led the kind of browbeating of the mayor that they should have and might have made some difference. What are the politics of this from the standpoint of Christine Quinn, the city council speaker, who had to agree on these budget details with the mayor. It has to pass the city council, and she, of course, is hoping to become the next mayor. The, the politics are people who think that the mayor is going to back Christine Quinn see the budget as his gift to Christine Quinn. Um, I think that the mayor might back Christine Quinn. I think it's going to be useless to the speaker in a Democratic primary. But I know there are people in the administration who don't want to back Christine Quinn. I think there's sort of a fight going on for the mayor's ear on what to do in the next election. And it's going to play out in the next year or so. Is the other side of that argument um, from people who have the mayor's ear and say, you should hold out for somebody like you? Yes, Somebody exactly. who doesn't come from the Democratic Party establishment? Exactly. That's what they're saying. The question is, is Christine Crin really his rightful successor? Is she really the most moderate Democrat in, person in the Democratic primary? And does that matter if she's that moderate? And there are people, a lot of people, who say no. As a matter of fact, the business community is getting increasingly worried about Christine Quinn. I talked to one uh, major um, executive whose job is politics, that's what he does, who said he went to the one forum held so far and he came away very worried about the city's future. Because of something in particular that she said? No, because of what all of them said oh, that or was didn't a... say. That was the m minority uh, contracting debate. I think the very fact they all, that they all came to, to a forum <laughs> on that issue sent a message about this is what the future of New York is Just all about. Just that they came to a forum. If somebody decided to hold that forum, that's an issue. I think it sent a message among business. I know they're talking to me about it all the time. Um, what should the city do if they're going to fundamentally restructure in the way you think is needed? If the city has to take a fundamental look at what its recurring revenues are, its employee costs, and especially its employee headcount. 
Um, we have to decide what kind of city government we can afford. And look, there are a lot of imponderables. Will there be a budget deal in Washington? Will aid to, for, from the federal government to New York be substantially cut? In any budget deal, the answer, of course, is yes. Um, will we seek to raise taxes sharply, especially on the rich in New York, and what will that do to our future? And with our tax base still so heavily based on Wall Street, what are the prospects of that? But the mayor's got big gaps in his, out, in his budgets for the next few years, despite incredibly optimistic economic assumptions. So in our last minute, why would Mayor Bloomberg take a dive on this. He's a lame duck. He doesn't have any political um, uh, blowback that could come to him from anywhere. On other things, like big sugary drinks, he's saying, OK, these are the things that I believe. Now I can do what I really believe, which he's tended to do all along as, as sort of a non-politician. Why isn't he doing that on this? I think early this year, he said to himself, I have only a limited amount of clout. What am I going to do? And if you remember, the State of the City address was all about fundamental education reform. I think in that moment of time, he said, I'm not going to fight a budget issue this year. I've been down that road a lot. I'm going to fight education. Now, that sort of petered out in a way. And so he's gone to sugary drinks, which uh, is an easy one because it doesn't need the council and all that. So I think they made a calculation. I think there are even people in the administration are not sure they made the right one. Greg David, thanks a lot. Thank you. And that's it for this week's show. We're here every Wednesday at 7.30. Next week, quinoa is the miracle food, really miraculous. And check out my daily radio show, weekday mornings at 10 on WNYC. Tomorrow morning at 10, live coverage of the Obamacare decision if the Supreme Court reveals its historic ruling as expected. That's on 93.9 FM and AM 820 WNYC. Talk to you then.